Awesome. That is great. Thank you so much, Representative Burkett. And thank you, Joe. Where did Joe go? Yes, hello. Thank you, Joe. Aren't they heroes, you guys? I mean, wow. Thank you. So this room is a collection of righteous rock stars like I haven't seen. I mean, I think we have enough justices from the Supreme Court that we could, we could do a little pro-life business if we're, we're, you know, we could get, just get together and maybe do some work. Um, it's a particular delight to be here on such an auspicious occasion, your 30th anniversary. I know that not every single one of those 30 years was easy, but you held steady all those years. So true congratulations are in order. Congratulations to you. Yes. Yes. I'm also thrilled and honored to be back here in my home state. Y'all, the Tex-Mex situation inside the Beltway, it's a disgrace. I try to get to Texas at least once a year just for the food alone. But don't tell my family, they think I fly in for them. <laughs> Truly, it's always so refreshing to get out of the swamp and spend time with sane, reasonable Americans here in the Lone Star State. That's right. That's right. Where everything is big and beautiful and huge, especially the pro-life movement. But. The pro-life movement isn't just big in Texas. This movement, which is the greatest civil rights and human rights movement the world has ever known, is growing stronger every day. Now, I know our moms always told us not to brag, so I won't tell anyone if you don't. Come real close while I whisper. Don't look now, but I think we're winning. It's true. True news, not fake news. I'm old enough to remember when all young people, and certainly all women, were presumed to support abortion. These days, it's just the opposite. It's springtime for the life movement. Our movement is younger every year. <coughs> the other side doesn't want you to notice, but Americans are prouder to call themselves pro-life than they have been in a generation. There are a few younger pro-life activists whose names you would probably know, who I've been lucky enough to get to know in recent years. They're so much hungrier and harder to satisfy than my generation is. They have this virtuous, righteous impatience, and they're always pestering me about when this or that attack on life will be shut down. No matter what we do to fight for life, it's never enough, and they're right. It isn't. I love it. I love being out outraged by the next generation. It tells me that we really are winning the argument because the cool kids are now pro-life activists. They are a reason that we know, that I know, that we are hashtag winning. Now, I'm a resident of the swamp, so I can't possibly know what's right without a poll telling me. So let's walk through some numbers, which I hope will help you to not let your hearts be troubled. For the last decade, about 75% of people have supported restrictions on abortion after the first trimester. Did you know that? 75. Yeah. This year, that includes 60% of people who consider themselves pro-choice, and almost as many almost as many of those who supported Hillary Clinton for president. I know. Well over half of Americans consider abortion morally wrong. And another area where a solid majority agree, ending taxpayer funding for abortion. Yeah, I know, you wouldn't know it. But all this consensus sure doesn't stop them from calling us the extremists, right? They try to intimidate us. The most vile things have been said about the pro-feminist, pro-life, professional women who serve in President Trump's administration. If you watch the fake news, you've been told that women who are 
true feminists have all joined the resistance to rebel against the patriarchy or something. The resistance, that name, is, I presume, supposed to conjure up images of freedom fighters in Nazi-occupied France. But if there's anyone who's a freedom fighter, it's you. You who fight for the freedom of the most defenseless among us to stay alive. If anyone's a true feminist, it's those in this room who want to empower women with love, support, and information they need to navigate a crisis pregnancy freely, fearlessly, and without regrets. And if anyone's a rebel, it's people like you who fly the flag of the greatest insurgency in human history, a rebellion against the dictatorship of the culture of death. It's a flag of truth and life against the powers of darkness. Now that's a rebellion worth fighting for. The truth is, the real war on women, the most vicious misogyny the world has ever known, is the pro-abortion movement. First, they attack the very thing that makes a woman different from men, the unique and irreplaceable ability to grow and give birth to new life. No little girl dreams of growing up one day and choosing to end the life of her son or daughter while still in her womb. Not one. No one plans of that wonderful day when she will get a chance to shout her abortion on Twitter. So a movement that tries to normalize what can only be called a disaster in any woman's life, what most women would consider a nightmare rather than a dream, that's not feminism, it's misogynist extremism. The second way that the abortion lobby manifests its misogynist extremism is how it directs the bitterest vitriol toward pro-life women who speak up and who act to protect women and empower them so that they never feel that they need to make such a choice, so that such a choice is never even contemplated in civilized society. Only misogynist extremists would go after women, many of us mothers ourselves, who dare to oppose them and their anti-woman, anti-child agenda. But of course, we have to consider the source. These are the same people who were silent about, or worse, defended Kermit Gosnell, that convicted abortionist serving three life sentences for delivering babies alive and then killing them with scissors. Only extremists would defend grisly late-term abortion procedures that fueled Gosnell's business model for so many years. But friends, take heart. There are more rational, normal Americans than these extremists. Think of the tens of thousands who crowdsourced the funding for the true crime film about Gosnell, released just last week, and that's been distributed to mainstream theaters across the country. But I don't need to tell you this. It was Anne McElhaney, one of the filmmakers, who stood right here last year and told you all about it herself. And they had a banner opening weekend this past weekend. And that's because of the market power of the pro-life movement. Life is on the march in the culture. But we're winning the argument for another reason. A little thing I like to call science. This generation has grown up with the scientific question quite obviously settled when you watch those images in the womb. As my hero, Kellyanne Conway, likes to say, whether it's Instagram or a sonogram, people believe their own eyes. That's a baby. Isn't she awesome? I love her. She deserves a round of applause. I've worked for healthcare issues for two decades now. I've worked on issues affecting the most vulnerable among us, the most at risk of illness and death, from children in war zones in Africa to injection drug users in American cities. I've worked on Obamacare. I've worked on Medicare. I know what healthcare is and what it isn't. Abortion isn't healthcare. <laughs> Innovations in fetal surgery have taken the question of a baby's humanity right off the table. 
You've seen those photos, right, of the little hand wrapped around the surgeon's finger? The real science deniers are those who say that that hand isn't human. What is it that we're operating on in there, a unicorn? <laughs> we can watch these surgeries with our own eyes on YouTube. Now that's healthcare. That's science. And there's no biological or scientific difference between the 20-week baby who gets cutting-edge surgical techniques, techniques to save her life and a 20-week baby who just gets the cutting edge of an abortionist's instruments. What a cruel subversion of the Hippocratic Oath to force the trained healers among us to become hitmen. Think about what it takes for a young medical student or resident who invested so much in learning to save lives to set aside that noble vocation. Think about the lies he has to tell himself the first time he learns how to dismember the smallest and weakest of his patients in some misguided attempt to help the bigger and stronger patient. That's not health care. Nobody is healed, not the children whose lives are snuffed out, not the mothers who so very often feel they have no other choice, not the doctors whose souls must grow more numb with each procedure, and not the taxpayers who may be forced to support this unthinkable choice, either directly at the state level or indirectly at the federal level. Everyone involved is left damaged or worse. Thousands of times a day in America, in Texas, right here in Austin. President Trump frequently mentions the forgotten men and women. Well, the most forgotten of all are the unborn, silenced forever by abortion and their parents whose dignity and parenthood are sacrificed every day in the service of the voracious global abortion industry. This industry preys upon and exploits women who are at their most fearful, most vulnerable, alone, and hopeless moments. In any other context, a transnational conglomerate that profited off pushing elective invasive surgeries or toxic chemical regimens on hundreds of thousands of vulnerable women and girls every year, that business would be rightly the object of the harshest criticism from those who claim to speak for women and girls. Those who claim to speak for women and girls would rightly condemn such a business model in the strongest of terms. And they would rightly demand that all civilized nations similarly condemn any business that exploited the bodies of such women and their children for profit. Instead, we see just the opposite, don't we? It is we, the true human rights activists, who are reviled and attacked for caring about these women, about their children, and who want to end the exploitation and commodification of their suffering once and for all. You, all of you in this room, you are the ones who've been speaking the truth, the appalling truth about what abortion is and what it isn't. And I know how demoralizing it can be for you, because it is for me too, when elected leaders waffle and dissemble about abortion and who use the euphemistic language of the other side and who seem afraid to stand for what everyone knows in their hearts to be true. I don't know about you, but I've had just about enough of the soft peddling and kid gloves the delicate way we dance around the barbarity of this industry, lest, God forbid, we offend somebody with words that actually mean things. You know, words like baby instead of pregnancy tissue. I seem to recall someone somewhere saying that the truth will set you free. Now, I'm a married woman. There's my saintly husband, Giovanni, right over there. Yes. That is right. Yes. Our anniversary was yesterday, October 19th. Yes. He puts up with a lot. He knows better than anyone else how much I like to throw things at TVs when politicians dance the Texas two-step around truth. And that's why he understood when I nearly lost my heart to another man on our anniversary, October 19th. 2016. 
It was on that day that this other man simply said what no politician has ever said on so big a stage. At the third presidential debate, he was asked about late-term abortion, and he answered this. I think it's terrible. In the ninth month, you can take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb of the mother just prior to the birth of the baby. Now, you can say that that's okay, and Hillary can say that that's okay, but it's not okay with me. Now understand, I was already an unapologetic supporter of Donald Trump. I was working on his campaign, mind you, long before that debate. I thought I was all in before October 19th of that year, but I wasn't, not yet. I hadn't yet burst into tears during a presidential debate. You see, as the campaign team had prepared the debate prep materials, I was the one who had carefully and gingerly scripted all the answers to abortion questions. I had crafted responses that I thought were forthright but delicate with all the usual muted tones politicians use. And then he wasn't 10 minutes in before he threw out the rule book and said what so many Americans think in just the way we think it. Pro-life America knew that Donald Trump had their backs. Would you guys mind if I bragged a little more on him for a few minutes? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, because his record in office has been just as bold, just as fearless, just as unapologetic as his rhetoric was that night. So let's begin. On day one, he reinstituted Mexico City policy and made it stronger than ever before in order to protect taxpayers from having to subsidize the global abortion industry. The policy went from covering about half a billion dollars in foreign aid to about $9 billion. Now there was all kinds of hysteria from the abortion activists over that, but you know what? In the end, the vast majority of grantees have been willing to comply with the policy. All of course, except the most committed abortion conglomerates like International Planned Parenthood Federation. But that was just the beginning. The Trump administration also defunded the United Nations Population Fund for colluding with China's brutal program of forced abortion. No hesitation on that one. Domestically, there's a lot to talk about too. So many pro-life wins are going on at the state level and the last administration's hostility to these efforts were still in place when President Trump assumed office. This administration rescinded the Obama-era prohibition on states defunding abortion facilities in their Medicaid programs. Yeah. President Trump also worked with the Congress to pass, and then he signed a bill that reversed the Obama-era regulation prohibiting states from excluding abortion facilities in their Title X family planning programs. And speaking of Title X, this administration proposed new regulations to reverse the years of entanglement of your tax dollars with the abortion industry. Because the law prohibits Title X from funding abortion, our proposal would rescind the current requirement the Title X providers refer for abortion, and the proposal would require the physical and financial separation between these programs and facilities that receive Title X funding, and any program where abortion is a method of family planning, which it's not. Can you think of some organizations that might choose not to apply or might not qualify for funding under such a policy? Oh, I can too. Now, some of you will remember that President Reagan was the first to implement a similar regulation. The abortion industry sued him, of course, and he and President George H.W. Bush defended it all the way up to the Supreme Court, which upheld the regulation. However, shortly thereafter, President Clinton was elected, and he reversed the policy during his first month in office. We've waited a long, long time to propose new rules to set things right again. And the Health and Human Services Department is working through comments to this proposal as we speak. But don't worry, we're not done. 
The Trump administration has also proposed robust regulations to ensure that the 25 statutory protections of conscience rights in healthcare are enforced. As I said earlier, no healer should be forced to become a hitman. That kind of coercion is against the law. Under the last administration, when complaints of violations of these statutory conscience protections were filed, they were simply left to languish until victims just stopped filing complaints, and the number of complaints dwindled to almost none. Our proposed rules would ensure that doctors and medical students and residents know their rights and know where they can go to vindicate their rights if they are being coerced into performing abortions or undergoing abortion training. Since we announced that our new conscience protection division is open for business, we've seen a dramatic increase in people seeking help, and we're taking these complaints seriously. Government should exist to secure your rights, not violate them. Also, you may have heard that the Trump administration reversed the Obamacare mandate requiring the Little Sisters of the Poor and other faithful groups to, to violate their consciences or else shut their doors. We issued interim final rules, interim final rules, to address that violation of conscience quickly. That's the kind of regulation that goes into effect right away. And the final rule, we're working to finalize it, they're going through the last stages of review right now. One of the highlights of our first year was this beautiful rose garden ceremony on the National Day of Prayer. The president signed an executive order to better protect religious liberty of all Americans that day. And we had made sure that the Little Sisters were in the audience. So he saw them. I mean, a pair of nuns kind of stands out in a crowd. Right, sisters? <laughs> and he spontaneously called them up to the podium with him. And he made their lawyer from the Beckett Fund stand up too and take a bow for the good work he was doing and suing us and demanding the sisters' conscience rights be protected, including by fighting us in court. You see, they had sued the Obama administration over the Obamacare mandate, but it was the Trump administration that had the privilege of settling that case with the sisters. And that was a banner day. Speaking of memorable events, one of the most moving moments for me in this White House was when President Trump defended little Charlie Gard, the British baby who was taken off life support against his parents' wishes by the government health system. If you want to see where government control of health care leads, just take a hard look at Charlie's story. It is a tale of horrors, from death panels to judges who think they know better than parents, and ends with a government bureaucracy forbidding this little boy's parents from bringing him here to America where a leading researcher thought he might be able to help. This is what happens when there is no Texas Alliance for Life, when there is no righteous power of the people, and there is no right to life at all. I was so proud of President Trump when he took a stand for Charlie and his parents. Do you mind if I keep going? Thank you. Thank you. Shortly after the inauguration, the March for Life came to town, as it always does every year. Vice President Pence couldn't wait to be the first vice president in history to address the marchers. And last year, President Trump himself addressed the marchers, live by satellite from our side event in the Rose Garden. It was the sweetest day. He loved it. He loves talking to pro-life crowds. But that's not all. President Trump supported legislation, just as he promised he would during the campaign, that would have defunded Planned Parenthood if they continue performing abortions. He also supported legislation that would have ended abortions on babies who are old enough to feel pain. But wait, there's more. President Trump has pushed back against the tyranny of extra-constitutional judicial activism by appointing a literal parade of constitutionalist judges to the district and circuit courts, including right here in the Righteous Fifth Circuit. Yeah. But we all know that we're not just winning in the lower court appointments, don't we? We now have a Supreme Court, Justice Gorsuch, and of course, Justice Kavanaugh. Doesn't it 
have the loveliest ring to it. Justice Kavanaugh. Justice Kavanaugh. I just can't hear it enough. Folks, I haven't even listed everything. That's all just the big stuff. And President Trump isn't even two years in. Now, don't get me wrong. We still have plenty of unfinished business, as those young activists I mentioned earlier would be quick to remind me. Still, I couldn't be prouder to work for this president, who has been so bold to defend the lives of the unborn and to protect the conscience rights of all Americans more than any president in a generation. He's just different, y'all. He's totally fearless. In the service of what he knows to be right and true, he doesn't waver. And it has been the privilege of a lifetime to serve in his White House and to help him keep his pro-life promises to the American people. Now, despite my youthful appearance, what? <laughs> and despite my populist bad attitude, I have been actually mucking around the swamp in my chest high waders for a very long time. In my time in DC, I've worked for a lot of elected leaders, including some undisputed heroes and warriors in the pro-life movement, and they are wonderful. But I don't think it takes anything away from them to say that this president is a force of nature all unto his own. For a man who is pro-choice for a lot of his life, he has the heart of a lion when it comes to defending the unborn. Unlike the cynical media who are so close-minded in the service of their narrative, I think most of us can relate to the president's conversion on the life issue. He was moved by a relationship rather than some abstract philosophical argument. He had a friend. She had a dilemma. He saw that dilemma grow up into the apple of his parents' eye. He changed his mind. Just like so many of our friends and neighbors, and I suspect some of us in this room. People often ask me why I was so drawn to Donald Trump so early in the primary process. He may be a Manhattan billionaire, but darn if he isn't just like so many of us. He's got this common sense wisdom that rarely leads him astray. It was that same down to earth relatability that resonated with me. And I knew it was resonating with the country. But the deal wasn't totally sealed for me until I saw something else in him, something critical. Donald Trump's instincts in hiring a team. We all know that the Reagan team used, used to say, personnel is policy. It's so true. Candidate Trump hired a couple of mentors of mine in the Senate, principled, strategic conservatives, who I really respected and who had spent their careers a bit on the outside of the establishment crowd. In Washington, if you actually believe in stuff, you're never quite on the right Christmas card list. One of these guys ran the campaign's DC office, and the other was leading that office's policy operation. I could see they weren't sleeping very much, so I offered to help out if I could. Fast forward into the Trump White House, and you can't help but bump into known movement pro-lifers. Mercedes Schlepp and Kellyanne, Sarah Sanders, and so many more whose names you don't know, but whose sleepless nights and endless sacrifices, including by their families, on behalf of the pro-life cause, it would make you so proud. In addition to White House staff, the president's earliest and highest profile hires spoke volumes to me about his pro-life priorities, starting with perhaps the greatest hire of all, Vice President Mike Pence, and the pro-lifiest cabinet I've ever seen. Nikki Haley, Alex Azar, Jeff Sessions, Mike Pompeo, Ben Carson, Betsy DeVos, and of course, our home state hero, Rick Perry, just to name a few. I don't want to belabor the point, but you can't drain the swamp if you hire a bunch of alligators. We all know how the pro-life movement is too often seen by the political class. We're convenient at election time, but embarrassing in the off years. I want you to know just how refreshing and reassuring it is to walk around the West Wing and know that everywhere I turn are colleagues, mentors, and friends who have fought in the pro-life trenches for decades. I still can't believe they let us all in the complex every day. 
And we all take our hits from the abortion lobby together, which just builds resolve and solidarity. I think there was one media hit piece that called me and three other pro-life appointees the four horsewomen of disinformation. We loved it. We laughed together and thought maybe we should get t-shirts. Horsewoman. But the proudest day, the proudest day of my professional life was the day I made the Planned Parenthood enemies list. Yeah. Big day. Yeah, I actually called my parents to brag about it like a schoolgirl. My dad wanted to know if there was something he could get that would frame it. A big part of the fun was sharing real estate on that list with so many other Trump officials with our most unflattering photos, of course. Now, it may have been our names on that list, but we well recognize that each of you is on it with us in spirit. And we also recognize that the federal government is only one piece of the picture, and some would argue not even the most important piece. So we lock arms with our state and community partners in this fight. Honestly, some of the best medicine when the fake news gets us down is hearing about your exploits in the states. Texas is an honest-to-God inspiration. We talk about it all the time in the White House, whatever the latest drip, drip of awesome news coming out of Texas. I mean, there are obviously too many things I love about Texas to list, but the very first thing has to be how hard and how aggressively you fight to defend these innocent babies and give their moms more information and real health care. You all pass more laws and wage more court battles, and you win some and you lose some, but you never quit. In this room, that's right, give yourself a big round of applause. That is right. In this room are some of the most strategic and fearless voices for the defenseless, and we can't do without you. Texas Alliance for Life is indispensable and indefatigable, so you are in the right room tonight, at the right time, with just the right kind of people. Take a look around you. Texas needs every single one of you. Texas moms, Texas babies, they need you, but more than that, America needs you. America needs your witness and your grit, your heart, your time, your treasure, your prayers, and your downright decency. Please know that we see your hard work and we are cheering you on from our swampy zip codes. Our heroes in the heartland are like chicken soup for the beltway-dwelling, baby-loving soul. We stand in solidarity with you every day as you stand for and with every pregnant mom in crisis who longs to discover that there's a better choice than abortion. And as we stand together, let me make this one promise. President Trump and his whole administration, none of us will rest until all Americans, no matter how small, are safe and their futures are bright. I'm not tired of winning yet, are you? The pro-life movement, we're not done winning. We've only really just begun, so stay tuned. Thank you for having me.